So ASTs are this amazing tool that help us build uh, really, really interesting things. And I just want to ask a few more questions just to get more familiar with everyone. How many of you are mostly front-end programmers here, like uh, HTML, CSS? Uh, okay, okay, like maybe uh, a quarter of the people. And how many of you are using JavaScript like all the time in your day job as like your primary thing? About half. How many people are primarily working in other languages? Wow, that's really cool. So I don't know very much about other languages somehow. I mostly know about JavaScript. And um, so if I say something stupid about another language or something, please forgive me. I'm, I'm still learning about these things. So um, OK, let's go. So abstract syntax trees are this amazing tool that lets you uh, inspect and manipulate your code with confidence. Uh, they, they're something that's not unique to JavaScript, but as JavaScript uh, programmers sort of discovered or remembered about this thing called ASTs, they started doing really powerful and amazing things. In a really simple sense, an AST is basically like a DOM for your code. It's not a perfect analogy, but if you can imagine that, that you have your, your code and then you can convert that into some sort of data structure that you can do interesting things with. You can poke around at it, you can change it, you can manipulate it. You know, sort of like a front-end programmer might think about uh, manipulating the DOM of, of a, a web application. So what, what is stored inside that, that, that DOM or that data structure is really the meaning and the, the purpose of your code. It doesn't have every single thing like the, um, doesn't have all of the, the white space and the comments, just has the, the core of what the code is trying to do, which is why uh, so many interesting things are built with ASTs, things like minifiers, you know, syntax highlighters, static analysis tools, uh, even browsers use ASTs internally for their just-in-time comp compilation to make your JavaScript run really, really fast. So, and then of course, like how many of you are using Babel? Yeah, like everyone that was using JavaScript at work is also using Babel, it appears. Um, it, it's, it's really cool stuff. And one thing that I hope is that, you know, maybe if you're not familiar with ASTs, that this talk will help you better understand the tooling that you're already using. Because a lot of folks are, are using Babel and then something weird happens and they don't understand what's going on. And so my hope is that this will let you sort of peek under the covers a little bit and, and figure out what's happening just like one or two layers under your stack. And if you, if you do understand at that layer, you'll be much more able to debug things when they go wrong or hopefully invent something cool that uh, no one ever thought of before. So let's see how it goes. Just a, just a basic idea of how ASTs work. I mean, just super simple. You've got your code there, represented by a blue square. I know that's what my code looks like. Then you have some kind of parser. Yeah, totally. And it converts it into a tree. Um, so that's pretty much it. Um, I want to keep it simple. That last talk, like Jeremy's talk, was like smart stuff. This is going to be like simple stuff. Uh, like some squares and stuff. I think it'll be good. Um, this is my level. I've got a degree in environmental planning, so like I know more about that kind of trees than uh, the syntax trees that I'm going to be talking about. So forgive me if I say the wrong thing. I, I really don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so we're going to make an AST out of this code. Uh, I've lived in a lot of places, and I can say certainly that Seattle has lots of rain and trees, so might as well uh, save it to a variable. So. Just, I spent a lot of time on the, you know, Keynote really sucks at syntax highlighting. Um, <laughs> it, you have to do it by hand, and so there's a significant amount of inconsistency. As you can tell here now, it requires green, white, you know, it's just so, it's just, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, so this is how you get your, your AST. So you put your code through something like Acorn. There's also a couple other parsers out there, like Esprima, Esprit, Babylon is, is, the, uh, for, is the fork of Acorn that Babel uses, but they're basically all the same API. So you can just require them in the parser and run like esprit.parse or acorn.parse and then shove your code in there. And then you're going to get this tree at the other side. Um, you know, I, I know what you're saying, like that is not a tree, that is some blocks. And that's true, but uh, you can just imagine kind of like a tree and it, it'll make sense in a minute. So this tree represents the code. It has four different nodes, the program node, the variable declaration, the variable declarator, and the binary expression. One thing that you'll understand as you start dealing in AST land, 
you'll start really getting to know all the different types of things that happen in JavaScript code and the very official names for them. So then if you look at the spec, you'll say, like, hey, I know what a variable declarator is. That's like a real thing. And, and you can sort of um, relate that to actual code because you um, have lived in this AST land long enough. It's, it's a good land. It's a strange land, but it's a good land. So to, to describe these things in, in, um, in code, you can see here on the left is the node, as it's called, the part of the tree, and then the right is the, the actual code that that represents. So your variable declaration, that's what that var thing is. The name of the variable is the declarator, so in this case, Seattle. And then you have your binary expression. That's like, if you plus something together, they call that a binary expression. I don't know binary. I don't know exactly what it means, but I just know if there's that plus in there, it's going to be a binary expression when you turn it into code. <clears throat> and your tree doesn't have to only like look like these little purple blocks. It can also look like a JavaScript object. And when it looks like a JavaScript object, you can start imagining, oh, I know how to use tools um, to look at JavaScript objects. I tried to color code it so it matched the, the colors on the block. So you can see how this data structure encompasses all those different parts of the tree. You have your all those nodes, as they're called, all the parts of the tree, the parts of your code, are there. You've got your program node, your variable declaration, your variable declarator, and your binary expression. And, and while it looks like sort of a wall of information, and you don't have to understand all of it, but realize that all of the code, everything that's actually happening there is living inside this tree. So with this tree, you can actually uh, you know, recreate the code if you wanted to. So it, it has enough information that you can do that. And we'll show you some of the, the things you can do with it. So, so we're going to stop right there. I want to show you now some of the fun things that we can do with trees. Because I explained the basic idea of syntax trees, and I, I don't know everything about them, but I know that you can do fun things with them. And for me, I just want to build cool stuff. Like, I don't care about fancy data structure, science things. I just want to make cool stuff. And so I hope that I can show you briefly how to make cool stuff and get you excited about using uh, syntax trees to do it. So these are these three areas where you can build amazing things with syntax trees. And we're going to do them all today. And it's not even very hard. And you're all going to leave here thinking, like, I can do this. I <laughs> am awesome. Because uh, ASTs really give you superpowers when you learn how to use them. So the first thing we're going to do is talk about static analysis. Uh, then code mods, and then transpilers like Babel and, and such like that. So first things first, uh, the, the tools that we'll be using for uh, wrangling our trees, ESLint for static analysis. How many of you use a linter, JSHint, uh, ESLint, JSLint, those kind of things? Yeah. How many ESLint people like know it well? Oh, wow. OK, people. Here's the thing. This is a really, really, really good tool. And I hope that I can get you excited about why this tool might be more powerful and, and hopefully really worth taking a look at. Uh, ESLint is a fantastic tool. It's done by Nicholas Sackis. And I'm, I'm one of the contributors, so I'm totally biased. But I really like it. Um, and it's a, it's a great tool for, for both linting as well as you know, doing like finding bugs like in, a, in a more intense way. I'll talk about that in a second. So, uh, then there's JS Code Shift. Anyone, anyone use React here? React people. So React has been it's an interesting community. Like they always update things and break things every time they come out with a new React. And I think people got kind of mad about that, so they started coming with this thing called Code Mods, where every time something new came out, they would just like give you this little script you could run that would just like automatically update your code to use the new version. So that even though it was like a crazy breaking API change, it would just like work. Now, like, if you actually tried to use it, you would know that it's, it didn't always work, but it pretty much just worked. <laughs> and the tool that they use for that is this cool tool called JS Code Shift. And there's a, a bunch of smart folks at Facebook working on this stuff right now. It's really amazing. And then Babel, we talked about. OK, those are some great tools that, that use trees. And we're going to write plugins for them and do interesting things with them in like 20 minutes. It's just, it's just amazing because it's so simple. So, uh, real quick, in order to get into the mindset of how to actually work with these tools, there's two things you, you really need to understand. The first thing is this thing called visitor pattern. How many of you have heard of visitor pattern? Yeah, these are all the smart programmer people that use other languages than JavaScript. Uh, where are the lights? Okay, that's fine. You don't have to, I don't care about lights. It's fine. Okay, that's too bright. We need to go down. Yeah. 
That's right, that's right there. Otherwise, like, my eyes will start to get weird. I can't see anyone. <laughs> Quit it with the lights, man. <laughs> you gotta stop with the lights. Walk away. Walk away from the lights. <laughs> I'm gonna keep talking. <laughs> I think. Is this one of those like programmable like light things and like someone screwed up the API every time you said dim it gets brighter or something? <laughs> Internet of things. <laughs> it's fine, can I do stuff? That's good. Yeah, good. Thanks. Alright, <laughs> thanks for the light people. <laughs> Yeah, I'm never getting a nest. It will freeze me out of my house. Um, okay, so visitor pattern, people. Um, visitor pattern is something that lots of people, especially people that have done ASTs, which like lots of other languages have invented before JavaScript, they use this all the time. And there's like a Wikipedia about it, and it's like these like 25 like uh, line Java programs, and I look at it, and I'm like. I don't know, this is too complicated, but the JavaScript version is pretty simple, and I'll tell you how it works. So basically, it's like you're climbing on a tree, okay? You've got all these different nodes or limbs of the tree, and you find something that you like, and you stop there, and you visit it for a while. <laughs> you, you take a look at one part of it. It's like a way of, or it's kind of like, I live on Vashon Island right now, and like I got these binoculars because I always wanted to look out, because it's like, you know, I always think on the ferry I'm going to see like um, some dolphins or something. I mean, it never really happens, but like I'm always looking, <laughs> like just out the ferry window, just like searching for them. And think of the visitor pattern like you've got these binoculars to look at your tree, and it has like a filter, and you can tell it to only look for certain types of things. So like only show up if there's like a certain type of bird in the tree or whatever. It's, it's, it's a way to sort of filter the tree. You're going to loop through the tree, but you only want to look at certain things. So here's what my tree looks like. and with a visitor pattern, let's say I only want to inspect variable declarations. Okay, so I will, would create this object and say, for the key, I would say variable declaration, show me nodes of type variable declaration, and then I can give it a function, and that function would then do something. So here, I'm just looking at one branch of the tree. Instead of having to look at that big tree, lots of complicated, fancy things, I just want to look at the one type of thing and do something to that one type of thing. That's kind of visitor pattern. I, I'm really bad at computer science, but I, that's my version of it. I like that simple version. And uh, so here I went from the, the big tree to just, just one little branch of the tree. It's much more manageable that way. Uh, cutting down a whole tree is too complicated or too heavy and it will fall on you. You just, you just think of one branch at a time. It's much safer. So how do we apply this to static analysis? So we talked a little bit about linting before. I'm a super big fan of ESLint. One of the things I want to get across about linting is it's not just about formatting. Like, you think about things like, oh, linting, it's cool, like semicolons, no semicolons, uh, space after a plus or something or, or before an equal. But actually, like, this is the genius of static analysis. The genius of static analysis is you can fix a bug um, and, and maybe add a unit test to make sure that that bug doesn't come back. But you might have to fix a similar bug again somewhere else in the code. But say you fix a bug, and then you write an ESLint rule that catches that class of bug, then you can prevent that entire class of bugs from ever entering into your code base again. So it gives you this great power to prevent dumb things from happening over and over again. Like I write lots of bad code. And so I like to have these rules that I write to prevent me from making the same mistakes over and over and over and over again. So, um, Really powerful static analysis. We're going to show you really simply how to write this ESLint rule. Now, just to understand about ESLint, it's a linter for JavaScript that lets you, it has its own like set of rules, but it also lets you write custom rules. It's really easy to either install new rules with a plugin, like say you use React and you want to have like 20 different formatting rules about your, uh, your JSX uh, stuff and how you use React uh, classes or whatever. There's all these rules you can just install to enhance it to make it catch more things. Or at work, if, if I notice someone, some group of people are making the same mistake over and over again, we can write a custom rule to prevent people from making that mistake, say security or, or things like that. I work at PayPal. You know, this is stuff that we think about all the time. We've got lots and lots of engineers. We want them to do a good job. So let's write a really simple rule. Let's say we're looking at this, this code right here. We're going to keep working on this code. I'm sorry the trees weren't green. It's just it's in my head. I got different colors going. And 
let's say that you know we're using ES6, we're really excited, and we realize that it's always raining and there's always trees in Seattle, so we want it to be a const instead of a var. So we want a rule to enforce this to make sure that it's constantly raining uh, and there's constantly trees here. So we can do that. It's easy. We'll, we'll use ESLint. We'll write a custom rule to do that. So let's go back to our visitor pattern. So we want to visit the variable declaration because that's really where we say var whatever equals whatever. So once we once we do that, uh, we're gonna let's look more carefully at what that variable declaration node looks like. It has a type, a kind, and then the declarations themselves. The declarations like Seattle equals something. So here we want to look at the kind. So the kind in this case is var. But what we care about is making sure that the kind is const instead of var. So what we need to do is use a visitor pattern, look for variable declarations, and check to make sure that the kind is const. And if it's not const, we should complain. Very simple. I think it's pretty simple. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's totally simple. So here's the basic idea of how to write ESLint plugin. You say, you know, like you, this is in Node, so you'd say module that exports equals function. You you pass in this context, and then you return your visitor object at the end. The context gives you special ESLint abilities, like to warn. And then this is what our visitor object is going to look like. Our visitor object is going to say, "Hey, let's look for variable declarations, and if those kinds are if the kind of declaration is a var, then we should tell them, you know, this is this is not good. You don't want to do this. You're a var var again." Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll tell them, and it will be great. So the whole plugin is is all of five lines of code, and you know it's, it's sort of squashed a bit to fit onto the slide, all right. But this is my ESLint plugin, and and if I go here, uh, you can see I can just put this in and and tell ESLint, hey, I've got this plugin, run it on my code, and it will actually give me the error. And if I have, uh, you know, I use like WebStorm, so if I have WebStorm, it will just tell me in line that I'm doing something wrong, it will catch that bug. Uh, well, bug. it's a fake bug, but, okay, I'm gonna skip the ESLint demo. You got the screenshot of it up there. It's pretty easy, you just kind of like, put your, your custom rules in a folder, and you tell ESLint about your rules, and it will run those rules on your code. I mean, couldn't it be simpler? It's amazing. Nicholas Zakis, he's really a genius. So uh, moving on from that, ESLint's fantastic, but I think the real thing that people care about right now in JavaScript are these, these transforms, like going from uh, one type of code to another type of code and like modifying, you know, ES6, ES5, or is this like, is this like Microsoft land? Are there a lot of TypeScript people? Is that a thing here? No? Okay. I mean, it's cool. I, I'm cool. TypeScript's really interesting. I'm just curious. Like, I, I want to just get a sense of what people are working with. So um, I think that's very popular, though. And I think there was a time in the community, in the JavaScript community, where people were, there was a, a, a small, like, dedicated coffee script group. Uh, but then most people were sort of like, no, transpilation is sort of weird. And then Babel came out, and everyone's like, oh, actually, I like transpilation. That's cool. Uh, I want that. <laughs> and, and all the people like trolling CoffeeScript are like, yeah, CoffeeScript is terrible, but like I really just wanted fat arrows the whole time. They were jealous. So, so, so we talked about our, our, our AST flowchart before, um, code into tree. The way that the transforms work is sort of the reverse AST flowchart of you take your tree and you, uh, you stick it through a generator and you get some code out of the other side. So you can kind of go uh, code uh, to parser, to tree, and then to generator, and back to code. So it's this full circle thing. And so what that means is if you have your tree like this, you can go in and like decorate it all up, like put on like, you know, like Christmas tree or something, like make it nice, make it better, soup it up, soup up your tree. And then you can, you can export it out to some code, and, and then your code will be super code. Like, it, you souped up the tree, then you have super code. So, uh, now tools like JS Code Shift and Babel, they will give you these um, the special tools to go in there and, you know, modify your tree and do fancy things and make it sort of shine more, whatever you want to do to your tree. So, we're going to create a simple Babel plugin. Now, you know that Babel, how many of you have done... Uh, have migrated to Babel 6. Any Babel people have done the migration? You, does anyone like want to like that? It's sort of, he's sort of laughing Dale back there because it's kind of a pain. It was like everything broke. And, and basically what happened is 
instead of just defaulting uh, your Babel upgrade, uh, your Babel to just turning ES6 to 5, they sort of said, oh, actually, we're just like an ecosystem for transformations, which, which, like, I'm the only person in the world that was like, yes, that's the greatest thing ever. Like, what we need is a better platform for applying transforms, and it's going to be amazing. Um, you know, Browserify sort of did that, but it wasn't nearly as uh, advanced as the Babel ecosystem. So while everyone else is sort of trolling, uh, Sebastian McKenzie and all the fantastic people that work on Babel, I was just there thinking like, yes, ASTs are going to be like mainstream now. People are going to get this. And, and here's why. Because with, with um, Babel, you can build a simple plugin to do whatever you want to your code very, very easily. So if you remember before, we had this const Seattle equals rain plus trees, okay? We decided that we wanted to enforce this because it happens all the time. It's constantly raining or whatever. So we're going to do this. And then... Um, we realized though that our browsers don't actually support const. And so despite um, ha like wanting to write this cool code, we need it to work also in normal browsers. So we need to take our tree and, and, and sort of modify it again so that it will work in older browsers. And we can do this very easily. Now, to write a Babel plugin, you'll notice it's almost the exact same way as you write the ESLint plugin. You export a function, this one takes a, a Babel instance and then you return an object which has a visitor property and that visitor property again is your uh, your visitor object so uh, this should look fairly familiar this is almost the reverse of what we had before with our um, ESLint rule so what we have here is your variable declaration we say we care about variable declarations and when we get there uh, this time, instead of the direct node your, itself, you're going to get a path. Now, a path is kind of like a, a special wrapper around the, the node of the tree so that it, it lets you do fancy things like go to the parent node and it has a little bit of extra information. But in our case, we don't care about that fancy stuff. We're just going to go directly to that node, that, that part of the tree. And we're going to say, if the kind is const, then let's convert it into a var. And we just do that. That's our plugin. Well, we have to wrap it in the other stuff. And we have now this plugin that will convert our code from the fancy const version to a version that can be read in browsers. So you're thinking, I don't care about doing that. Default Babel um, uh, presets for ES2015 will already do that for me. I don't need to do anything about const. And it's true. But what I want to demonstrate here is that think of something crazy that you want to do with your code. So for example, Say you like writing uh, dot for each, and you have a coworker that's saying like, no, you should write for loops by hand because they're like slightly more performant. And you, you wanna like throw paper airplanes at them because it's really frustrating. You just wanna write your for each loops and, and, and your dot filter and all that sort of thing, but they're like saying, no, 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 you should convert this to a while loop or whatever they're telling you. So you could write a Babel plugin that did that conversion for you. So you could write your code for humans and then export it to some sort of computer readable format on the other end that's fast and fancy and makes browsers happy. So it really gives you great power if you learn how this stuff works. And secondly, understanding how this works will help you when your Babel thing blows up at some point, which it will, or like your tests don't work properly in, in some sort of uh, transpiled environment. You can dig under the covers a little bit and start to look at what's going on and you'll understand it a little better. Um, so let's take a look at how you'd actually apply this plugin here. I'm gonna see if I can quickly jump to, jump, oh, is that actual, no, that's a slide. I was like, is that my terminal? Let's see if I can get to a terminal in a way that you can see it. Okay, this is ESLint here. You're very bad, it's so corny. So, um, let's see. I can't see it on my screen, so I have to do this kind of magic to, uh, to remember what it was, it's one of these. Babel, yeah, let's see how much I do this there. Okay, so, okay, so let's go to my code. My code lives in a file called code.js. It's pretty clever, and we're still using var. So that's why when I ran ESLint on it, it complained. And that's really wicked of it, so we need to go in and update ourselves and change this to com. Now that we've changed it to const, we can find our Babel and it's dash dash plugins 
And the plugin that I want to use, I call plugin.js. This is not fake, it's just called plugin.js. And dash dash plugins, plugin.js. And we're going to run this on code.js. Now, what this should do is give us the fixed version on the other side. Okay. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. Let's, let's just reconsider this. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, Babel. Yeah, that's, I know I was missing something. I like, literally can't see the screen, so I'm just kind of guessing. Yeah, see how it's VAR, Seattle? Did you see that? It worked. Yeah, it worked. And so that's the idea. You can write this code. It's like five lines of code. Like, I can understand that. It's not complicated. Um, and you can read that code and say, like, we can transform one thing like this to something else. If you have an even better idea of something more fancy or, or complicated, uh, to transform, you can do that too. It will be more than five lines of code, but it will still be doable. And you can say, I could build off these building blocks and kind of make it a little bit better. And so I really encourage you to check out this stuff. I think it's fantastic. I'll show you one last tool that will sort of kickstart your ability to learn how this stuff works. And that's this really fantastic website. Not my Trello backlog. <laughs> um, yeah, it's this great website. <laughs> Can I like turn around? Okay. Um, all right, I have to go to like mirroring. It's so embarrassing. Okay, and then we'll go back to Chrome. And, you know. Hey, that's we're getting somewhere here. Um, okay, it's this fantastic website called astexplore.net. And I'll just show it to you. I think it's nice, astexplore.net. I think it's written by uh, someone named Felix King at Facebook. And they realize that AST stuff is really, really yucky. And it's, it's like a murky world. And, and they realized that the tooling wasn't very good. And so they came out with this, this really cool thing. So you have your code over here. Not that. You have your code over here on the left. And then it has the tree of what that code looks like over here on the right. So you can see your code and you're thinking, okay, that's great, it's, it's a tree, that's fine. But then it also has this other feature, which is the transform option. So I can go and say, hey, I wanna make a Babel 6 transform right here in the browser. Um, and let's say I don't like, uh, oh man, that's kind of messed up. Um, let's say, I, yeah, yeah, so, so I, can, I can run my, my Babel transforms right here in the browser. And then if I want to also create uh, a JS code shift one, which is the, the other one um, that I was telling you about, the other cool tool, I can just go over here to transform and click JS code shift. And there it has uh, like a sample code down in the bottom that I can use. I know it's not super easy to read, but I can't make it too much bigger because there's so many uh, different things going on. It has like sample code. And so, for example, if I want to do my var thing again, uh, here all I have to do is say, let me make this a little bigger so you can kind of see it. Um, watch this. So this is this is JS Code Shift Transform. I this has like a jQuery like syntax. They're trying to be they're like too cool for visitor pattern, which all the other AST tools use, and they're like we are going to use jQuery style and like I don't know. It kind of is confusing actually. Uh, it's it's a little bit. I, I get the analogy that it's like jQuery and it's DOM is kind of like an AST, so maybe it works, but it's a little bit confusing. So, but but just just briefly, so they'd say um, they, they'd have their JS code shift wrapper and they they'd run it around the file and then they say find all. In our case, we're going to find variable declarators and they have these these constants um, that you can use to find things and then they're going to replace all those nodes with a new node. So in our case. We're going to replace those old variable declarators. We're going to go, in this case, we're going to go back from const. Sorry, we're going to go var to const. And here's how it's going to work. I'm going to say j uh, variable declarator. And then it's going to start complaining that I didn't give it an ID. So I need to give this variable declarator. Sorry, declaration. That's, that's, that's it. I need to give it a kind. So I want to go from var to const. And then I need to give it the declarations themselves. So in this case, I just take the old declarations, 
think it's start declarations here. Yes. So here we've gone. Yeah, you heard that, didn't you? So here you've gone uh, back from var, uh, back to const. So again, this, this tool, JS CodeShift, you can play with it in the browser, but you can also use it. Uh, this is how they do all those code mods for the React stuff that sort of work. And if you, do, if you are interested in them, I have a, a project that I'm working on called ES, uh, what is it called? Five, no, yeah, five to six code mod. It's the opposite way, because I'm trying to get our code using that modern stuff, and so it's five to six dash code mod, github.com slash um, five to six slash five to six six dash code mod. So you can start using these um, you know, ES6 things on your existing ES5 code base. So just one last thing of how this works. So if I reset all this, and all this code from these examples is, is living on, uh, on GitHub, and I'll, I'll share that link in a second. But then I can run, let me make sure I get this right. J, so I've got my code for JS. I've got the old var stuff. I want to upgrade to const. I say JS code shift dash T, and then I've got my code mod file, which is just the stuff you saw in AST Explorer.net, and I will run that on code.js. Does some fancy stuff, and we go to code.js, and it's const. Yeah, you should clap because it's great. Um, got like one or two more slides. So uh, yeah, check out AST Explorer. Uh, .net. It's a fantastic tool if you're interested in ASTs. I know that I'm all out of time, but thank you so much for uh, listening to me ramble on for the last 30 minutes. It was so much fun.